Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for that fantastic worship. Thank you for those incredible testimonies. Thank you for the prayers. That is good. There's something here for everybody, okay? Um, don't feel left out. Don't feel on the fringes. If you're here this morning, it's not by accident. If you're watching on, uh, on Zoom or on YouTube, it's not an accident. The Lord is personally interested in every single person um, and doing something. So I know there have been a lot of people up at the front or whatever, but uh, for everyone, there is something that, um, that God has for you. When we do these church lunch Sundays, we try and do a shorter message and just try and explain the essence of Christianity um, to people. Uh, if you've got it already, which I assume that pretty much everyone here has, then just let it settle in your heart again, be re-inspired, re-encouraged, um, and pray it for your non-Christian um, friends. If you're joining us on YouTube, this is for you as well. Um, just engage and listen and hear. I'm a little bit nervous um, because this actually is, is the most important thing ever. And I don't want to mess it up for you. I don't want your spiritual life to be affected by whether I get my words out in the right way. But God loves every person and has got a plan and a purpose for every person. And this message is the most important thing. You know, I've had the privilege, even the last couple of months, I've done some really amazing things. I've been some, with some really posh, impressive people, um, and I've heard their stories, and yet nothing compares to this. And we're not talking about a lifestyle choice. We're not recruiting for a sports club or a common interest group or whatever. If you're human, you need this. If you're alive, you need this. This is for everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish because that's what's going to happen if you don't. But receive the gift of everlasting life. I will read about another verse from the Bible from John's Gospel just to prove I'm a Christian. Here we go. Um, John 1. Very, very short. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He gave the right to become children of God. What on earth is that? What is earth is that? You become a whole new person. Everything changed. You get the right to. Without receiving him, you don't. With receiving him, you do. That's it. That's the sermon. Do you want this? Do you want it? It's not something which happens in a just a vacuum, in a neutral. If God is this good, if there is something called purity, beauty, love, courage, self-sacrifice, if there is something so gorgeous and eternal about God, and we look around at the world, we've had prayers this morning for the utter desolation and pain and agony of, of humanity. Freud even said if we didn't have the words for wickedness and evil, we'd have to invent them to explain the Holocaust. If there is something called spiritual evil, then there is a battle going on. And you are made in the image of God. And if there is an enemy, he hates God and he hates you. And so it's not just a matter of, oh, well, I'll, you know, I'll give it some attention when I feel like it. You're in a war zone. And there is a battle for the hearts and the minds. If you have received Jesus, then some of your friends, some of your family haven't. And you know there is a battle going on. And we don't always have the freedom to say, oh, well, I'll do it when I feel like it or whatever, because there's a war going on. Some of you know that I used to be in the Royal Navy. Um, and I will explain to you just very, very briefly. This is interesting. OK, don't go to sleep three aspects of something called electronic warfare okay so before we get to the bombs and the bullets there's a war going on in the electronic world and you'll know some of this already one of the things we did on our warship if we heard that an enemy was using a particular frequency 
and they were using it to either to talk or to control missiles or whatever, then we'd just work out which frequency they were using and we would jam it. We would just put more power on that frequency <laughs> and stop them using it. Just make a lot of noise, so much noise they couldn't hear themselves think. It's how drones are being stopped in Ukraine or whatever. It's just jamming. Is there equivalent? Is there sometimes people are trying to find God and there's so much noise, so much clutter, so much stuff in the way, so much distraction they can't hear themselves think there's a battle going on. If we were unlucky to be locked on by an um, anti, anti-ship missile and its radar had phoned us, we would um, we had these things like don't don't laugh. We had these giant. It, the best example I could use. They were like party poppers. Okay, giant party poppers on the back of the ship. They didn't fire off bits of ribbon and, and streamers and glitter, but they fired off lots of streams of little um, metal foil, tin foil. Something they discovered in World War Two. We put this great cloud of tin foil into the air to pretend to be a ship. Now it might not look much like a ship to you or me. But to a a radar-controlled missile coming to find the ship, it would be scanning, looking for the ship, and there'd be a tiny little signal from the ship because we put RAM, radar-absorbent material, all over the ship. But they'd find this big cloud of tin foil and think, oh, that looks like a ship to us. And it would go and attack the tin foil, not us, which was a good thing. It wasn't a ship, but it pretended to be a ship. It was a counterfeit. How many counterfeits are out there? People looking for something spiritual, looking to find something spiritual. Oh, this seems, this seems religious, this seems gaudy, this seems good. Um, or even, it's not even that spiritual, it's just good. It just takes my attention. What's right, what's, what, this seems, but it's not the spirit of God. It's not the heart of the gospel. And so many people get deluded by chasing after. You're gonna give your life to something. You're going to give it to something, but chase after all the wrong things. It's not they're wicked, bad people. They're just running after counterfeits, things that take the place of God. Sometimes the Bible calls them idols, stuff that fills your life that doesn't give you life because only God gives you life. And lastly, this is really cool, okay? Sorry for the engineering lesson, but radars work by sending out a pulse. It gets reflected, and then you time the length it takes to get back to you knowing that electronic waves go at 3.10 to the 8 meters per second as you all know um, you can work out how far away it is so what do we do we heard a ping that we'd been we caught so we we recorded it we amplified it and we sent it back just a bit too late so the receiver's looking around gets a small blip is that a ship and then a great big blip comes ah oh, that's it but it wasn't us it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't the ship, it was a signal we'd sent. We were beaming stuff at our enemy to confuse them. If that happens in the natural, do you think stuff gets beamed at people? Thoughts and ideas that are not from God to confuse people? You know, we had this lovely lass, she was a young Christian, very enthusiastic Christian, just got saved. Um, interestingly, she was, so, she was so caught up in it, she started speaking in tongues with not even knowing what speaking in tongues was. She said, I've got these words, they don't mean anything, what's that? Anyway, that's another story. Um, she'd missed a few weeks, I shared this on Thursday night actually at the Radical Basics course. She, she'd missed a f- quite a few weeks, and when she came, she was a little bit sheepish. Um, and I said, um, oh, Amanda, and that's her real name, so you know, there's no, uh, there's no privacy here. Um, I said, oh, Amanda, I said, and I felt to do this, I said, has it been like this? And I leant forward and I said some stuff in her ear and she looked totally shocked, sprung back and said, have you been in my head? How did you know what I was thinking? I said, oh, I know because I know the enemy. And the things I said, you'll know them. You're not wanted here. You're not a real Christian. You don't belong. Don't bother with church. And those were all the things that were going through her head, which had kept her away. They hadn't come from God. Sometimes stuff comes into our minds that is nothing to do with God. There's electronic warfare, there's spiritual warfare. And we've got to be a praying people, because when we pray in the name of Jesus for this message to go out with a clarion call, 
people's eyes will start opening, their ears will start opening, they'll start realizing that this thing is the best, since, best thing since sliced bread, okay? It really, really is. If people knew the goodness of God and what was really going on, they would flood to the front. They'd flood to the front to give their lives to Jesus because this is good news. The enemy says, God is boring. He's going he's gonna to denude you of your personality. It's going to be dull. It's going to be less for you. And the opposite is the truth. You get the spirit of life that enables your personality, sets you on fire with a passion to be the person that God has called you to be. And take this gospel of the good news everywhere. So before explaining what it is, I'm just going to say what it isn't this Christian message. You know, some people very, very skeptical. They sort of track with us a bit. And after a while they say, oh yeah, okay, well maybe. I think I think I'm probably a believer. I'm a believer now. I believe in God. Well, that's great. I'm sure the Almighty is delighted that you're giving mental assent to his existence. But that's the start of something. There's a lot more than just believing in God. You know, Hitler believed in God and so does Satan. I would say, oh, well, I'll, 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 I'll come to church. I'll, I'll, I'll be a good person. I'll, 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 I'll attend church. Keith Green, very famously, an uh, American worship leader, said uh, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Okay? Coming to church is great. Encourage it. There's so much stuff that gets caused here. But it's not activity that we're talking about. It's identity. It's not what you do. It's who you are. Some people say, so it gets rid of that excuse. Oh, well, I'll, I'll be a better person. I've got a, I've got a Christian sort of moral. I, I live a Christian sort of lifestyle. Have you heard that? Have you heard people saying that? You know? you know, the biggest counterfeit, the biggest counterfeit isn't Buddhism or Hinduism or materialism. The biggest counterfeit is religion. That's the biggest one. It looks so like Christianity. Stand up, sit down, say some prayers, all very holy, wear some holy garments. I'm not knocking people who believe in traditional churches, and there are a lot of them, but there are a load of people that go to traditional churches that haven't got a clue that Jesus died for them, and they need to respond in their hearts and let him into their lives, make him their, their savior and their Lord, the real gospel. And it's not a question about what we do. Oh, I'll be a good person. Um, that isn't, that isn't it. Well, maybe I need to experience something. You know, when God shows up and, and I, the Archangel Gabriel appears to me in my bedroom, then I'll believe and I, I need to fall over or feel something on my body. No, there are loads of believers, you know, nice, good, solid personality types like mine, you know, very rational, never felt a thing in their life. I have actually since I used to be that and now I'm something else you can move on you can get healed um, but it's not about experience it's not about behavior it's this do you receive him he came to his own but they didn't receive him but to those that did he gave the right to become children of God if you're listening I don't care how much money you've got in your pension fund, or how nice you are to your extended family, or what a moral lifestyle you use. Have you received Jesus as your savior and your Lord? Because that is the question that stands into eternity. That is the thing that matters. That is the heart response, because if you do, you get the right, and it's not assumed just because you're white and middle class, you're going to be okay on the day. He loves people. He wants you to be transformed into his likeness. How are we doing? How much Jesus are we carrying? Let's receive him more into ourselves. What is the content of this message? I think the core of it, if you want to look at the distinctive of Christianity as opposed to anything else because it is totally unique, is that the God who made a universe that takes 38 billion years at the speed of light to try to start to cross got reduced into a human body, gave up his godness, his power, and became 
frail in terms of being a baby. The fullness of the God had dwelled in Jesus. He knew what it was to get tired. He knew what it was to be hungry, to be thirsty. He knew what it was for people to say defaming things against him. He knew what it was not to get justice. He knew what it was to have pain. And yet at every stage, although he taught and is set the high water mark for moral behavior, although he healed and that caused everybody to kind of love him and follow him, ultimately he did something which you or I couldn't do. He took on the power of evil and wickedness and he let it have its way on him full frontal. And he defeated it, not by more strength, not by more violence, not by more justice, not by more. He came at it in the opposite spirit. So as humanity was rejecting him with venom, scourging him, crown of thorns, mocking him, beating him around the head, stripping him naked, piercing his hands, putting him up on the cross. The, the worst that humanity could do, the worst torture, six hours not able to breathe, lifting himself up in his arms. He not once came with all the power that he could have mustered, but he was led like a lamb to the slaughter because he was showing and proving that you could do your worst and all you'll get in response out of Jesus was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He loved completely. He loved the hell out of life, if you like. Even death, the last enemy of all of us, didn't have him. Jesus says, no one's going to take my life from me. Of my own do I give it. And after he had suffered and taken the sin of the world, literally, he that knew no sin became sin. At the end, he says, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And do you know what happened? He died, but there was an earthquake. And the hardened Roman centurion that was used to executing this scum said, surely, surely this was the Son of God. Even the pagan non-believers recognized at that moment that this was no ordinary death. And it was no ordinary death. It was the death that didn't work. Because death didn't destroy Jesus. Jesus destroyed death. Peter later said death was not able to keep its hold on him. He then went into hell not to suffer anymore, but to proclaim to spirits long departed what had gone on. Temple curtain ripped, as you know, separation between man and God broken. Dead raising in Jerusalem later appeared after Jesus appeared. The whole thing had changed. The problem, you know, sometimes there's such theology around. The cross wasn't about some angry God trying to get some vengeance on somebody and he didn't want to do it on us because he loved us so he did it on his son. That's not justice. What happened was the problem wasn't in God that he was mad at us. The problem is that we are captive to death and sin. Captive. Without this happening, you would be dragged to the place of destruction. There's no hope. You can't better yourself. You can't improve yourself in order to get this spirit of everlasting life. Jesus gave everything so that his spirit could be in us. It's a miracle. Forty days later, day of Pentecost, tongues of fire. What's the fire? It's the very presence of God. Came to rest on each of them. Set the church alive. The world has never been able to say, the gene is out the bottle. Sorry, that will offend your religious spirit. The cat's out the bag. You can't put it back. The Jesus has done it, and this message, and it doesn't matter how many people they try and martyr or kill or suppress, the Christian message is growing because it is life, and when people get it, they know it, and they're infectious, and they'll infect their friends by saying, we do not have to suffer under the 
wickedness and the evil and the tyranny, but we can speak a different message. We can speak a message of love and reconciliation and healing and hope. And it doesn't matter what happens to us. They can kill us, but they can't touch our spirits because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither death nor life, angels or demons, present or past, nothing. Nothing separates you from Jesus' love. You don't get to die, it means. He tasted death for us. I've said it before, you're living one minute and then you're just more alive the next as your body falls away. This is the most exciting, important thing. And heaven, people, is not going to be dull. You're not going to get there and think, oh, is this it? You know? You're not. And it's not more of the same. This world is so tainted, so broken. This morning, as I, was, I just picked up a chair, um, the top came off, my hand went up, it knocked a beautiful, expensive bone china plate, Mrs. Turner doesn't know about this, yes, onto our tile floor where it shattered into probably 30 or 40 pieces, okay? So I put on the goodness of God on my, on, my, um, on my music system. I got down with my hands and knees and started picking up the pieces and said, Lord, what are you teaching me? And I thought this cannot be, you know, sometimes there's a chip, you can think, oh, I'll glue it together. This was so broken. This was, it was just going in the bin. And it's just like he said that some people's lives feel so broken. There's like, there's no hope. That it's impossible to mend it. But nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. However broken, however fallen, however far a life goes from God, it's not beyond his reach. It's not beyond his reach. He loves everybody from the finest looking respectable person to the worst absolute sinner. He loves all of them and he wants them in, back in his family. And it's up to us people to respond that i know we have received i don't know if you lot on youtube have received i'm going to get to pray for you guys in a minute but we have to personally receive this for ourselves and say lord more more of the power of god more of the passion of god more praying from my heart more believing that my family can get saved my friends can get saved my work colleagues can get saved because this kingdom is an advancing kingdom not a retreating kingdom you know, as parts of the church tear, tear themselves apart at the moment, there will always be a Holy Spirit demonstration of this message. You can't destroy it. It's the life of God. And heaven is going to be exciting. You know, on we had a busy week, as Cleo mentioned, coming into land. It was mad here, just mad. We couldn't go anywhere, couldn't hardly breathe, eat, couldn't, certainly couldn't use your kitchen or your living room or your dining room or anywhere. Finally, they didn't come in the bedroom, so I could retreat to the bedroom. I was fine up there. Um, but on, having had this all week, on Friday night, um, Caleb and Tom and Seb and I, we drove, I mean, we're crazy, three hours up the A303, up the M3. Why? Because we'd heard a rumor. We'd heard a rumor that there was a group of people that were worshiping God and we wanted to be with them. So we got there and I thought, oh, is this it? And then I started worshiping and I thought, oh, Oh, yes, this is good. And for the next couple of hours, I was like in heaven. The key thing about these people, this is not an advertised. You can't find it on YouTube. There's no Facebook page. There's nothing there. It's just word of mouth. But the key thing about this thing is that they were, they were teenagers. These were teenagers not being invited to be entertained. There was no kayaking or bouldering or rock climbing. It was just the presence of God. And they were passionate. And they just wanted to worship. And we just jumped in and we just worshipped and it was like heaven on earth. Same songs, same group of people, but the hunger drawing the presence of God like all. Oh. And as we came back, I thought, are we crazy? And then I had another three hours, got back at one o'clock in the morning, we're we crazy to do that. And all of us said that was so worth doing. That was so worth doing. That was so worth doing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, people. Set yourself on fire. Set yourself on fire. You can't do this by your behavior. It's only the Spirit of God in you. It's only the Spirit of God. Question is, do you want it? Right. 
YouTubers. Let's have opportunity to respond. If you have never responded to Jesus, and I think, I mean, if you're in the room and you haven't, then quick, you better pray this as well. But I think all of us have. You know, there's always, there's always reasons not to. You know, it's not a convenient time. I'm not ready. I won't be able to carry it through. Can't sustain it. Feels a bit uncomfortable. There are a million reasons why not to do this. And you can't sustain it. You're right. You will fail at this. You'll be forgiven and clean and white one minute and you'll mess up the next. And do you know what? That's okay. Because there is, there is something in the system that says you keep on coming back to Father. And he keeps on saying, it's okay, it's okay. And you just get stronger and stronger. The question is, do you want it? You know, there's a passage in Revelation where it says, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door. Do you hear his voice this morning? Jesus doesn't, he doesn't come with a behavior modification program. He's not put off by your history. But he wants to get through that calcified, hard heart that's kept him at arm's length. It's not your respectability that matters. It's not your behavior that matters. It's whether Jesus is core in your life. Have you received him? He loves you so much. He's not put off by the things that you're ashamed of. He's actually attracted to brokenness because he comes and he heals it. Do you want him this morning? Do you want him this evening? Whenever you're watching, do you want him? Because if you do, it's just a yes. And just get to pray this prayer with me. Father, I thank you for the offer of life that is found uniquely in Jesus. I repent, I turn from myself, my sin, my appetites, and I turn towards you. I have a change of direction. That's what repentance means. And I ask, would you come into my life? Would you forgive me my sins? Would you make me a born-again Christian right now? Because I'm handing over my life, lock, stock, and barrel, to you. Wash me, cleanse me. Let me receive this offer of life for myself. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And if you prayed that, that's it. I had someone when I did this last time, he said, I watched the video and I prayed the prayer in the end. That's it. You don't have to feel anything, but maybe you will. Maybe there'll be a stillness, a peace, and you have to find a live group of people and join in with them. You need to really just pursue this. This isn't the end of a process. It's the start of one. Thank you very much.